I have to put those down because I'm really quite small. Um, but thank you very much, Sarah, and um, it's a great pleasure to follow your um, presentation. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at Leeds with whom um, I've been working for a number of years in this area, and I'll draw upon um, our work as a team throughout this presentation. And what I wanted to do was to marry the research evidence and the models of evidence-based practice that we might use, particularly to think about three key questions in leg ulcer management. The use of compression, choosing a compression system, and choosing a prevention of recurrence um, compression system post-healing. And this morning we had reference to David Sackett's evidence-based medicine model and this modification of it by DeCenso and colleagues is slightly more detailed in that as well as clinical expertise, research evidence and patient preference, it also acknowledges the key um, issue about having the resources to be able to do something, whether that's time or um, the, actually be, being able to have things which you can prescribe. So whenever each bit of this, this um, model all point the same direction, then clinical practice does not have huge challenges. So if we have the clinical expertise and the research evidence, patient preferences and resources all pointing in the same direction, there isn't a huge clinical challenge. However, I wanted to take some examples where perhaps we're having to balance, for example, patient preferences against the research evidence or considering the resource implications and investigate how we might proceed in those circumstances. Because people don't seem to talk about those times whenever all of the evidence doesn't point in the same direction. So sometimes, for example, you can see that in the top left-hand corner, we could provide care in one way or another. So this model might be referring to choosing a dressing or a bandage or a drug or an intervention, or it might be the way we organize care. The details of that are unimportant for the moment. But say, for example, we could deliver things in, in one of two ways. And that on the top right, the resource implications, they're not particularly different whether you choose one approach or another. However, those of you in the audience practicing clinically will be faced with challenges when the evidence points one way and the patient preference points the other way. Is that something that you experience clinically? Yeah. And nobody talks about that. So it's one of those sort of secrets. What do you do? Do you go with what the patient prefers and hope that your professional body doesn't ever find out because professionally we're supposed to deliver evidence-based practice? So it can get slightly more complicated. What if the research evidence is pointing one way, the patient is pointing the other way, but again, even the resource implications are drawing you this way. We don't seem to be talking about how you resolve this conundrum. So I want to take us through some examples and look at how we might start to become more eloquent in describing this situation and talking to patients about it. And I think what we need to do is start to become able to say, okay, X is better than Y, but that is not simply X is fabulous and Y is dreadful. Sometimes X is only a little bit better than Y, so we need to become able to say it's a lot better, it's a lot, lot better, or it's only a little bit better. So we need to become versed in that sort of discussion. And we don't do that very well yet at the moment. We also need to be able to describe the resource implications in that way. 
If things are more cost effective, is that a large difference such that our CCGs will balk at the difference? Or is it a really quite a modest difference? So let's become used to having those sorts of conversations. Because as clinicians, many of us are probably already having the conversations with our patients to say, you prefer Y over X, tell me why that's the case. So for example, in my experience, some people prefer system one over system two because they've had a bad experience with a particular team or clinician using system two. Now, that might not be about system two. It might have been something else happening in their health at that time, or it might have been something just coincidental. So it's important that we try and unpick reasons for those preferences. So using that model and thinking about how much better is one thing than another, and what do you do when the patient prefer prefers the non-evidence-based option? The first question I've posed is, well, do I need to use compression for venous leg ulcer healing? And when you look at the high quality research evidence to help you address that question, there isn't a lot of high quality evidence. There are eight trials summarized in the Cochrane Review, and there's one trial that I've been able to find published since that. And the bottom line from those nine trials, when you tabulate things such as the follow-up time and the healing rate in the compression group and the non-compression group, in the very right-hand column, I've summarized the sort of size of effect. So, for example, when I've said doubled, it means that the chances of healing in the follow-up period have doubled approximately. So that's a way of just describing the effect size. Is it small or large? And doubling the healing rate is quite a large effect size in healthcare. But I want to draw your attention to the column just before the final column on the right, which is the healing rate in people who didn't have the compressive treatment. And it's not zero. So some people were healing in a non-compressive regimen with their leg ulcer care pathway. And we don't talk about that either. So it's helpful for us to keep those two things in mind. One is that the healing rate without compression isn't zero, but that when you apply compression, you often more than double the chances of healing. So when you look at what the Cochrane Review says and how it brings together all that evidence, it says that there's evidence that venous ulcers heal more rapidly with compression than without. But they also note that a lot of that is based on trials with a high risk of bias or an unclear risk of bias. So the quality of the research in this area traditionally has not been high. The later trial by Wong and colleagues, um, as you can see there in their three-arm trial, showed that you would heal a leg ulcer probably about two months more quickly using compression than, with, than without. And that is one of the largest trials addressing this particular question. And Una Adderley and myself um, summarized all this evidence for a publication called Clinical Evidence and um, saying that overall, taking into account both the volume of information and the quality of the trial so far, that compression, I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear, is more effective at healing than non-compression. But that was only moderate quality evidence overall. So if there were more trials available in this area, it would refine our ability to describe whether it increases the healing time, or decreases the healing time, I should say, by months or weeks. So that's question one about the use of compression. So despite some poor quality evidence, 
the best chance of healing for anyone with a venous leg ulcer is with compression. But what do you do when there is either a reluctance to use or to tolerate compression? And anyone who has run a leg ulcer service will have faced a patient who is either reluctant to tolerate compression or will only take it in homeopathic doses. So I venture that what we should be doing is communicating very clearly and documenting for professional reasons the likely impact of the non-use of compression, for example, extending healing time by a number of months or having the chance that you'll be healed by six months' time, for example, so that we're talking about the size of effect the compression has with patients. And I think we should also then not abandon patients who are non-tolerant of compression and without considering other interventions which have been demonstrated to increase healing even in the absence of compression therapies. And one of the few which have been replicated in a number of randomized control trials is pentoxifiline. Um, and it's not available for nurse prescribing, but it is um, potentially available for, for medical prescribing. It's off license usage for venous disease, unfortunately, in the UK. So that's one area where you can balance a patient preference with the evidence base. So the next question is, if you're going to use compression, is there a best system? And unfortunately, there isn't a which guide that tells you about compression therapy usage. And there are a number of caveats about us comparing compression systems. There are about 40 odd trials in this area, which have made 26 comparisons. So there's very little replication of research. And research evidence only builds up by replication. Does a finding really stand true when tested by other teams in other settings? Or is it a unique finding? Some of the research is small and not poorly reported. And um, O'Meara, uh, Susan O'Meara in the Cochrane Systematic Review describes the quality of the review of the trials um, very eloquently. She also summarized um, in our Cochrane Review the spread of comparisons that are made. So for example, down that green line in the middle, um, the first number that you come to is two. And that means that there are only two trials that compare one single component bandage with another single component bandage. So really there's very little that we can say confidently about a large number of these comparisons. We have got a lot more evidence for four layer versus short stretch than any of the other comparisons made so far. And in the Cochrane Review, O'Meara and colleagues um, described six trials with almost 850 trial participants and do a very beautiful individual patient data meta-analysis that shows that you have nine days quicker healing with a four-layer than a short-stretch bandage system. However, since the Cochrane Review and that beautiful analysis was produced, there's been more evidence emerging. And with colleagues, I've been trying to collate that evidence from the Canadian bandaging trial, um, which is one of the largest bandaging trials ever done, with the results of the Cochrane Review, because we've not yet updated the Cochrane Systematic Review, uh, but that's in train. So in the Canadian bandaging trial, the time to healing for the two bandaging systems, four layer and short stretch, within a evidence-based protocol with clinicians working in the community who are all trained in applying both systems, there was no significant difference in the time to healing for both systems. And what we've done is we've added the Canadian bandaging trial information to the information from the Cochrane Review. And before the Canadian bandaging trial, the evidence 
summarised in something called the hazard ratio, which is an indication of how, how many people heal and how quickly. There was evidence that the four-layer bandage was significantly faster at healing than the short stretch. However, the evidence that you add in from the Canadian bandaging trial, finding no difference overall, brings that estimate back into there being no overall difference. So when you add all the currently available evidence together, comparing four-layer and short stretch, there is no statistically significant difference in the chance of healing at the conventional 5% level. And the, the conclusions from the Canadian bandaging trial are useful here to reflect on, because what we concluded there was that when you have a high quality of care system with evidence-based practice care protocols and people trained in both systems, then the active ingredient was compression to the lower limb. It was less important how that compression was delivered than you delivered compression to the lower limb. And so we felt that this was a positive finding for patient-centered care because there could be an open dialogue about the choice and the preference as long as nurses were able and competent to apply both systems then we could make a choice based on circumstances and context. So using the evidence-based practice model, for example, we can provide four-layer or short stretch. That's in the top left. In the Canadian setting, the costs were similar to deliver both systems, and that may be different in your clinical setting. And the systems appeared to have similar effectiveness so therefore, when a patient prefers one system over the other, then we can go with that preference, documenting the reasons for that, allowing us to revisit it should any of those circumstances change. But that may be different for your setting and for your patients. But using that model can help you describe the reasons behind decision making. And finally, Madam Chairman, I want to come to that question about the happy state when you are post-healing. What do you do to prevent leg ulcer recurrence? So compression therapy is recommended. And there's a question as to whether one should attempt to secure compliance with a high-strength compression sock or go with a medium-strength compression sock. So class three versus class two. There's not very much evidence in this area. There's some evidence that compression is better than no compression and only two trials which have compared different strengths of therapy. The first trial, as you can see, there was only a 7% difference in the recurrence rates between the two groups. So after five years, there was 39% recurrence in class two, moderate compression, and 32% recurrence in class three. And that was not statistically significant at the conventional 5% level. Millage find a bigger difference, and that might be because of the context of care. For example, the Nelson um, uh, trial, that was done with a very, very high quality supportive background so that the chances of recurrence even in class two were mitigated by very, very detailed aftercare. So if you are looking at the decision about high or medium compression for leg ulcer recurrence, then the evidence currently is pointing towards there being a preference for high compression being associated with less recurrence than medium compression. So we can provide class two or class three. The prescription's the same. They both cost similar amounts to deliver. Class three appears to have lower recurrence, but that's only based on two trials. And our patient prefers often class two to class three. So what do we do in that circumstance? Well, I think we've got to describe the size of the difference to clients and 
consider pathways such as Sarah has um, described potentially for moving from one system to the other. So in summary, Madam Chairman, we've discovered that compression is very better likely than no compression, but there isn't a which guide best buy and a lack of high quality evidence to establish superiority of one system over any other. The largest amount of evidence indicates that for people trained in compression in high quality care systems, then it's applying compression that matters rather than the mode that you use to deliver that compression. But there needs to be extreme skill and concordance in that application. And in the prevention of recurrence, class three appears to be better than class two, which appears to be better than no compression. And what we do know is that compression hosiery that sits in a drawer tends to have very limited effectiveness. And you can always tell that when it comes into clinic because it's a beautiful color and pristine. I'd like to acknowledge my, my co-authors again and say thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. And we, you, you've made amazing time time there and we've actually got a few minutes for some questions if anyone has any to ask.